Nifty Sides DC 2017 videos are brought to you by Threat Quotient. Introducing the industry's first threat intelligence platform designed to enable threat operations and management. And Data Tribe, a new kind of startup studio co building the next generation of commercial cybersecurity, analytics, and big data product companies. Uh, it says 2.30 by my watch, so how about we start? Thanks everybody for coming to uh, my talk on imposter syndrome. My name is Micah Hoffman, and in case you didn't know who I am, I am a person that's been very involved in the information security for, for quite a while now, and um, it has really helped my career, uh, my personal life, and so I love the opportunity to come and, and share some of the things that I've learned along the way with you all in hopes that, you know, it reaches somewhere inside of you and, and helps you understand maybe yourself or a friend or a colleague a little bit better. So um, I want to start off the talk telling you that every day I feel a little bit like an imposter. It's just who I am. But I don't want to talk about me just today. I want to talk about this guy. You all know who he is, right? Yeah. Who is he? Newton. Who said Newton? Where have you been? All right, so Albert Einstein, yes, you got the first part right. Did you know some of the cool things he did, right? I mean, he created the theory of relativity. He, he, he came up with that whole E equals MC squared thing. He, Nobel Prizes and so on, gravitational waves, which were unprovable. They were all in theory until recently when they actually could detect these gravitational waves. He was a man like 150 years ahead of his time. He was amazing, the things that he came up with. In fact, if I was to ask you to think of the quintessential physicist, I bet many of you would come up with Einstein as that, that representation. You know how I know? Wikipedia tells me. <laughs> no, but seriously, Einstein, who did all these amazing, amazing things, I mean, really was ahead of his time, he felt like a fraud. He felt like people were, were putting too much weight into what he was saying, into his thoughts, his ideas. He's like, I'm just putting down what's in my head. You know, anybody can figure this out. I'm nothing special. And he felt like a fraud. That was really interesting for me to hear. Because you know what else? Albert Einstein couldn't internalize his success which was clearly all around him at that time and has been proved over the years to be uh, even more accurate, his predictions, his theories, his other things. And ultimately, Einstein's subjective perception of how he felt about himself was different from how everybody else felt about him and his work. This is what imposter syndrome is. Now, let me take you back to when I first encountered imposter syndrome. I didn't even know what it was at the time. But I was, I was at DerbyCon 2012, many years ago, and I was walking back after a full day of being at the conference. I was walking back to my hotel, and I was talking to my friend Trevor. He was having a milkshake. And, and we were sitting there, and well, we were walking back to the hotel. And I was like, you know what? I just heard an entire day's worth of uber people talk about amazing things that I have no idea about. I started thinking, well, what the hell am I doing in InfoSec? What was I creating? What was I contributing back to the field? I wasn't talking at conferences. I, wasn't, I was just testing web apps. That's all. I was a pen tester. And there are thousands of me out there. Not only that, but I didn't have any zero-day exploits to trade for things. I, I didn't know how to program anything. Yeah, I could do some bash scripting, but eh, it's not really programming. Okay, so, so it's kind of like programming, but it's like using Perl. It's not real programming. <laughs> sorry. sorry. Um, yeah, so what I was finding is that a lot of the things that I was comparing myself to, a lot of the people I was comparing myself to, were doing amazing things that I wasn't. But honestly, my wife, my kids, my coworkers, when they talked to me, when they looked at my life and what I, was what I was going through, what I was having, my life was awesome. I was running a team of badass pen testers. I had a very supportive management structure at work. I had a family that was healthy and happy and engaged, and things were great on the outside. 
Inside Micah was really unhappy because I didn't really feel like I worked, I belonged in InfoSec anymore. So I started looking for a new job. Now I didn't find a new job, but I remember while I was listening, while I was uh, doing this job search, one day I was listening to a, a podcast and they were talking about something, just gabbing about stuff, and they came across the term imposter syndrome. And I was like, oh, I know what imposter means. I know what a syndrome is. Maybe this is something important. I listened and it started making sense to me. I did belong in the industry. I just needed to change my perceptions. So let's talk a little bit about imposter feelings or imposter phenomenon. It's actually not a syndrome. If you look up in the DSM-4 or 5, I think we're up to 5, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Psychology, it doesn't list imposter feelings as an actual psychological syndrome. It's a collection of feelings, perceptions, phenomena about yourself. And it was first described by two doctors uh, that went to grad school together. Dr. Imes and Dr. Clance, 1978. And what Dr. Clance found out was that she was working in a psychological field with a whole bunch of other really smart, driven people. And she felt like a fraud. She had her doctorate at that point. She was working with these people, and yet she, she didn't feel like she was really measuring up to what her students were doing, what her colleagues were doing. And so she did a study with Dr. Imes. And the result is their 1978 paper where they described how these high-functioning people on the outside don't feel very high-functioning on the inside. And that's really at the heart of imposter feelings, is that your subjective reality overpowers the objective reality that everybody else sees. So, in plain words, you see yourself differently than other people see you. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, we all have our perceptions about ourselves. But when your perception of yourself is markedly different from what other people see and feel about you, there can be some conflict there. Now, getting back to the psychology part of this, absolutely there are some psychological symptoms and disorders that can go along with imposter feelings. When somebody has imposter feelings, they can have any one of these or multiple of these. And they can be in a variety from mild to moderate to severe or even um, debilitating whether it's depression or low self-confidence or whatever. With imposter feelings, they are sometimes persistent in everything that you do, but more frequently, imposter feelings are about, uh, there, there are things that come and go depending upon the situation, depending upon where you are, what you're doing, and your comfort level with what you're doing. It's kind of an interesting thing to think about. And you know what's even more interesting? There was a study back in 2007 that showed that 70% of the people in the survey, and this was a big survey, 70% had at least one feeling of, uh, at least at one time in their life, they felt like they had imposter feelings. They felt like a fraud, even though they shouldn't have. I look out across the audience, I look at all of you, and I see some heads shaking here. I see that that 70% may be quite accurate today, you know, 10 years later, and that's okay. Stick with me, because imposter syndrome doesn't just affect one type of person. It affects all races, all genders, all, all, just anybody. It, it, it even impacts people of all career types, not just InfoSec. No, I mean, in these people that are in Hollywood, uh, Dr. Maya Angelou, an amazing, amazing creative writer, she felt it. She actually wrote that Every time that she was writing a new book, she said, this is the time they're going to find out I'm a fraud. Every single time. Or how about J-Lo? J-Lo thought, after, even after selling 70 million of her record albums, I know, record albums, I'm from the past, I'm sorry. <laughs> Songs, albums, I don't know what you call them anymore, you kids. Um, but even after selling 70 million of these, these albums, she's like, I don't know why anybody wants to listen to my music. It, you know, it's just the music. Even Harry Potter. Harry Potter, Liz Lemon, Don Cheadle, all of them. Yes, I know his name is Daniel Radcliffe. Um, but uh, all of them and more have these feelings of imposter syndrome. 
Imposter syndrome or imposter feelings generally resonate with people. They, they generally come out when you're in a pressure to achieve something. Oh my God, I'm not sure I'm gonna measure up. Oh my God, I have to give a talk in front of hundreds of people. What if they don't like it? Oh, I better make it better, I better make it better. So I was up late last night working on these slides, putting in these pictures of Harry Potter and stuff to make sure that it was perfect for you all. And that's another thing that happens with imposter feelings, is that you work so hard, you become a perfectionist. We'll get to that in a little bit. Imposter feelings sometimes happen when you have a, when you're surrounded by people that are smarter than you. Those people that know different things than you, or are working in different areas, and you're like, holy crap, I don't know how to, how to hack a car. Should I know that? Yeah, I should probably know that. Oh, I'm so dumb. When you might be an uber expert in reverse engineering malware. But when you measure yourself against other people's achievements, you start to feel bad about yourself. We also find imposter feelings come into play when you start a new project, when you're starting new work. You're, you're starting something that, that you're not sure of, either, of where you're gonna go, if you're gonna be successful. That, that self-doubt is natural, but the recurring feelings associated with it and what it makes you do or not do, that's the imposter feelings part of it. And the reality is, that studies have shown that the longer you are in a field, the, the more of an expert you become, the more likely you are to feel like an imposter. That's kind of weird when you think about it because you feel it, you, it, it's kind of natural to think, the longer I'm in a field, the more comfortable I should feel, right? Well, let's talk about this, the Dun Dunning-Kruger effect. Two researchers at Cornell came up with this idea based upon some perceptions they had that We'll take a look at this really nice graph here. This nice graph here on the x-axis, yes, some of you are reading it, on the, and some of you might be like, have, have worked with people that are at Mount Stupid now, but we'll get to that. Um, so on the x-axis, we have wisdom, right? Um, on the right-hand side, I'm sorry, the left-hand side, you're, you're very new at some task, some skill, some position, and then on the left-hand side, you are, I'm sorry, the right-hand side, you are a guru. You've been doing this, and you know how to do it left and right, up and down. On the y-axis, we have a, a subjective rating of how confident you are that you can perform that task well. Now, we've all seen these people. Uh, I see it as a, as a person that's been in InfoSec for a long time. I will go ahead and hire a new penetration tester to my team, and we're really happy to have that junior person on the team. The person comes on the team, they're like, oh yeah, I, I broke into this web page, and oh, I got a shell, oh, I got two shells, I am awesome! And they're at the top of Mount Stupid right there. <laughs> because their experience, they feel like they've mastered how to get a shell. Right? That, I, I'm the master of shells, and you know, this is great, because I know everything there is about shells. The problem is, they don't understand that there's so much else out there. So they have high confidence, but low experience. And with a high confidence, low experience, you're up at Mount Stupid. Until some senior person goes and goes, well, yeah, but you actually routed that through your local box here. So you're VPNing in, then you're coming back to your box, then you're going out to Amazon, what the hell? And so, you know, there, there's that recognition of, oh my God, there's other ways to do this. Oh my God, I didn't know about SSH, or I didn't know I could do port forwarding, or I didn't know I could bounce it off of some web socket. Oh, and what happens is they go down to that valley of despair because they now know there's so much more out there they don't know. And many people spend a lot of time in that valley of despair thinking about the things that they don't know. Eventually, what happens is you become more comfortable with the things that you don't know. Maybe you start tackling them. Maybe you make yourself a list. Maybe you make yourself some strategy to overcome that. You get learning. You, you do some CTFs. Whatever it is to meet your goals. And you get to the plateau of, of sustainability. With imposter feelings, it looks a little different. We still have that Mount Stupid, we still have that Valley of Despair, but getting ourselves out of that Valley of Despair is really hard and takes a lot longer because every step, every success we have, every success we have, we don't attribute to something that we did. 
So it's like, no, I didn't do that. No, the team, the team was integral in that. I, I just found this little thing here, and, and they did all the hard work. So you stay in that, that, uh, that valley of despair. And so our rise out of it is much slower. Getting back to our perception of things, perception is extremely important when you're talking about imposter feelings. On the left-hand side, this is how a person with imposter feeling feels about themselves when compared to other people. I know just this little bit, but everybody else here in the room, you all know more than me about all this stuff. So, so what do I have to contribute? I see this a lot. I work with a group of Nova Hackers. Any of you in the house? Yeah, thank you. So it's a local group, a local hacker group. If you're local to DC area and you want to travel out to Virginia once a month, Nova Hackers is a great, very welcoming group of InfoSec people. And we go to these meetings. And new people will come to the meetings and we welcome them with open arms. And we say, hey, once in the next couple of meetings, we're going to need you to stand up and present something. Because we run as a community. We want your input. And every single time, I, oh, I don't have anything to contribute. I'm, I'm new to InfoSec. I, I've, you all know so much more. Oh, my God, is that Mubix over there? Ah. And people do this over and over again. And what we have to realize is that everybody has something to contribute. You know more than me about putting a car together, or hacking a car, or reprogramming a Raspberry Pi to control your TV, or about jQuery, or whatever. Everybody knows something that other people don't. And so the diagram on the right is more like what reality is. Yeah, you might be new to InfoSec, but if you're right out of college, I guarantee you know more Java than I do. That's okay. Teach us about that. Because everything that we learn makes ourselves grow. This wouldn't be a psychological type of talk if we didn't have some kind of a cycle. And when in imposter syndrome or imposter feelings, we do have a cycle. In fact, we have two cycles. The simple cycle, we'll start by the, yeah, the gold star on the bottom. The, oh shit, I have a new project to do. Ah, and that creates a little bit of stress. But then you start talking to yourself like, okay, I got to do this talk in front of hundreds of people. I can do this. No, nah, it's going to fail. They're going to throw stuff at me. They're gonna, it, 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 it's going to be terrible. But you put in the work, and you do the talk, or you work on that project, or you write the code, or whatever, and it's not a disaster. And you realize, hey, this, is, this definitely doesn't suck. And then you have to do it again. You're like, oh, shit, I have to do it again. This is the simple version. The, the more complicated version is something like this. In this, um, I did give this talk, a version of this talk, earlier in the year at Besides Nova. This has some extra stuff in it, so um, stick with me here. But this, when I talked at Besides Nova, really it hit home for a lot of people that, that saw the talk. And if we started the achievement-related task in the upper left, that's where most things happen. So whether it's something at, at home where your spouse says, hey, I need you to repair this toaster or something like that, and you're like, oh, shit, what if I, you know, what if I don't? Or at work or in, with your kids or whatever it happens to be. You have some type of task. Now, that creates the anxiety, self-doubt, and worry, and that negative self-talk that we, people that, that have imposter syndrome, we feel so often. I can talk myself out of doing anything. I really can. I'm, I'm an expert at it. Or I'm a fraud at it, and you, you choose. Um, so what happens is, is once we've tackled that, we're like, oh, crap, I guess i got to do this. Then we either do one of two things. And sometimes we do them both. We either procrastinate. We go, well, I still have like 12 hours to work on those slides for that talk tomorrow. I, I can do it. It's only an hour. I can do it. And then you get to the point where you're like, oh, crap. And you create that stress. And, and you go ahead and you make the slides. And you just pray that they're going to work. I actually didn't do that for this. But you pray that they're going to work. And it does work. The presentation to the CEO works well. You get the contract. You got the job. Your task succeeded. And what do you do? You attribute it to the luck. Ah, oh, you know, it was just lucky. I had the right, the, the right images on Google that I put in there that really connected with the audience. It wasn't me. I, it wasn't anything that I did. And then that feeds into the red box over there. Now you feel like a fraud because you feel like it wasn't you that did the work. 
Or the other thing that will happen, if you don't procrastinate, you overwork it. You overprepare. And you will work on that project. You're only giving a one-hour talk or whatever it happens to be. But you will work on it for 40 and 50 and 60 hours because you want it to be perfect. It does work. And then you attribute the success of the talk or the whatever it is that you're doing to that over-preparation. So next time, what do you do? You over-prepare more than the last time. So now that one-hour talk, instead of taking 40 hours of your time, it takes an 100 hours of your time or something. You're really tweaking everything from the font shape and size and, ooh, do I use italics here or not? No, bold. Oh, is Comic Sans okay anymore? No, I think it's passe. You know, you're making these, these decisions and it all feeds into the perceived fraudulence. Now with imposter syndrome, we have a fear to succeed because that means that people will ask us to do more things, which creates more stress and makes us feel more like a straw fraud. But if we fail, that's even worse because now our strategies for coping with the stress didn't work. Oh my God, now I gotta do it even harder next time. I gotta uh, learn to code even better or whatever it is. And we have that negative self-talk piece. That constant little voice inside our heads that says, no, you can't do this. Or, really? What made you think that you could write this in Python 3 versus Python 2? Or whatever it is. The thing that talks me out of it. The thing that makes me go, hey, you know what? I, uh, I know I need to be working on these slides, but... I could also put something together with a Raspberry Pi. Yeah, that'd be fun and go do something else to distract myself and set myself up for failure. With people with imposter feelings, we also see them fail to try and fail to apply too. This is especially uh, true. There was a study done with women. Why aren't women applying for these types of jobs? And the reason is, is that they were afraid of the scrutiny of people looking at their resumes and go, no, you're not good enough. They didn't even want to apply. They didn't want to try. And with imposter feelings, you don't want that stress of being rejected. You don't want that stress of, what if I, what if I do get an interview? Then I have to go in there. And what if during the interview process, they ask me something I don't know? They might say I'm a fraud. Reinforcing. In fact, there's a failure to try when there's public scrutiny. What is public scrutiny? Well, what do we do in our industry here, right? In our industry, we're like, hey, you know what? If you want to be a part of cybersecurity or information security, take part in the conversation. Go on this public social media platform. Just tweet to the whole world. It's okay. Or if you want, go ahead and use another medium to, to, to talk about things. Out in public, where other people can criticize your ideas. Now, some Slack groups and some Twitter people, they are amazingly supportive and righteous people. But there are people out there that'll cut you down, that'll call you a fraud, even though you're not, and reinforce that, those bad feelings. You know what we also do? When people write code, instead of celebrating their code, we say, hey, take your code, put it out on GitHub, let me comment on it. Mm. Or if you have a great idea about something, like, man, that'd, that'd be a great talk at a, at, a, at a small conference. Why don't you come out to B-Slides Las Vegas? We only have 3,000 people that can look at your stuff. <sighs> at this point, you might be asking yourself, you know, do I have imposter feelings? Well, you might. If you can answer yes to these two questions. Do you feel like a fraud? And sometimes. You feel like somebody's going to find out that you're not really as talented or as capable as you thought? And are you unable to internalize success when somebody says, you know what, you did a great job there. That was amazing how you put those PowerPoint slides together and you really saved my ass. Well, you know, it's just something I do. It's no problem. Are you unable to internalize those successes? Now, imposter feelings... They come in all different shapes and sizes. So whereas today you may not be you know, stressed out and really feeling like a fraud, tomorrow in a different situation you might be debilitated. You might feel like you don't even want to send in that CFP response to take your good idea and talk about it at the next conference. That's okay. There's actually some psychological tests that are out there, some more tests that are, that are more psychological in basis. This uh, Google, I'm not here to like deliver malware to your browsers or anything. It's perfectly safe. Um, it's Google, of course it's safe, right? 
Um, so this, uh, this URL here is for uh, a link to Dr. Clancy's, web, or Dr. Clancy's website. Um, she has an online survey, 20 questions, and right then and there, you'll see as you start answering them, you'll see that you'll either be you know, to one side of probably not imposter feelings to the other, and she has a great scoring system at the end to help you understand, yeah, you know, this is, you're, you're probably feeling some moderate feelings or intense or what have you. The point of me standing up here is not to, to get myself, you know, to, to throw myself out there, but I want to make sure that you know if there's anybody out here that feels this, if there's anybody online that's watching this, you're not alone. There's lots of us that have imposter feelings. But the thing about it is, is if I have imposter feelings, the one thing I'm not going to do is stand up in front of a group of people and go, hey, I feel like a fraud. Please confirm that I'm a fraud. It's kind of, you know, it's kind of self-defeating there. So I suffer in silence. I keep it inside myself. And I whisper it to myself, or I don't try. I don't tell people. But I'm here to tell you, you can work to overcome imposter feelings. And I say work to overcome because it's a constant struggle, or it may be a constant struggle with you. As long as you can look at what you do from an, uh, an outside perspective, or you have a trusted confidant that says, hey, you know what, I see you're procrastinating there. My spouse does this a lot to me. And I appreciate her for it. For, I appreciate her for it. Hey, I see that you're working on that project. Should you be focusing on your slides? Might this be, you know, some feelings of anxiety that you're having? Well, yes, and shut up. <laughs> no, I'm nice. Um, but you need to start identifying your feelings. You need to start recognizing in yourself, I'm doing this because I'm scared. I'm doing this because I'm going to feel like a fraud, and I need to move past it. One way to move past it, in case you um, have been wondering the whole talk, is he actually going to talk about how to move past this? Yeah. You need to talk about it. That's hard. Talk about it to yourself in front of the mirror. Talk about it in front of your webcam so you can record your journey as you move through it. Find a friend, a spouse, a pet. Pets are awesome, right? How many, cat, how many people's cats judge them? Okay, not cats. How many people's dogs judge them? No. Dogs are awesome, right? You can talk to your dog all day about feeling stressed out, about feeling these things. Find somebody that you can talk to about it and that you really trust. Ooh, sorry. One thing that I'll ask you to do, stop looking up and look down. When I was at DerbyCon, I was looking at Chris Gates. I was looking at um, H.D. Uh, Moore. I was looking at uh, uh, Rafi Mudge. I was looking at these people who are uber people, and they're great people, and they have uber technical skills. But just because they have uber skills doesn't mean that my skills, my talents, are any less valuable. So stop looking at where you want to go and look at the path that you've traveled. Because in that path you've traveled, you'll be able to see based upon your achievements, based upon the projects and the progress that you've made, that you are somebody that's got cred. You are somebody that has skills and talent but you've got to track your achievements. Because if you don't, then your mind is left to figure out that. And when you are having those imposter feelings, if you have those imposter feelings, or if your colleague has imposter feelings, the last thing you're going to be able to do is go, yeah, I remember a time when I had success and it was, no, you're not going to do that. So put those trophies on the wall. Put those, those talk, you know, the, the, whatever it is that makes you remember what you did, that made you feel good, Make sure you note that down. Don't, don't just track your achievements. You need to start owning your achievements. And start saying, yeah, I did that. I made that Python. I made that Raspberry Pi do this. I did awesome at that project at work. That was me. Until you do that, it's going to be much harder. But you know what? If you do nothing else, I want you to do me a favor and take these words out of your vocabulary. These are words that minimize your efforts and reinforce in your head that, you know, it's, it's just a little thing that you did. Don't say, well, I just, or I only did it. They're going to minimize your effort. Stop saying them. Let's see what happens. This one's really hard for me. 
Practice accepting compliments. For the longest time, I was like Mr. Teflon. I would stand up here with my shield out, you know, like Captain America. People would come up to me and say, hey, you know, you wrote that, that Python program on whatever, uh, on, on un looking at untapped profiles. That was really cool. That helped me in this investigation or something like that. Thanks. And I'm like, that wasn't me. That was the community that did it. And their compliments would just bounce off my shields. And I wouldn't allow it to come in and hit me. Allow them to penetrate your defenses. Thank you. I appreciate that. I'm glad that it worked for you. I'm learning how to do that. This is a tough one. You're a perfectionist? Yeah, remember how I talked in that cycle about perfectionism being kind of a corollary of this, of imposter feelings? Yeah, if you're a perfectionist, you need to work until something is good enough. I was up last night, I, <laughs> this talk is a 50 minute talk and I have 76 slides and I looked at my wife last night and I'm like, 76 slides, is that enough? And she said, that's way too much. I was like, all right, I should do more then, right? Uh, the font's wrong. I was, really, figure out a point when it's good enough and stop. You can always make it better later, version two, version three. And if you are somebody that constantly works on something, you are somebody that can't let it go, set a timer, set a deadline for yourself on a project or whatever, hey, I'm only gonna work on it until this date, then I'm done. And I have to stick to that. Because otherwise, you'll start tinkering. I used to work as a volunteer, early in my life, I worked as a volunteer in an emergency room. And I was just one of those people that got the warm blankets out for the victims when they came in and, and kind of helped go and get things for, for the doctors that were doing the real work. And one day, a, a kid came in and uh, she had been bitten by a, a dog in her cheek, and so it was, it was really bad. And I'm sitting there, and, and I got her a blanket or whatever, and, and the plastic surgeon who's stitching up her face for her, um, he said, you know, Mike, I'll, I'll, I'll let you in on this secret. The enemy of good is better. I was like, oh, yeah, well, thank you. Man. But it didn't hit me until later on in my life that you can actually get something to a great state and be fine with it without trying to tinker it and make it that last bit better. Figure out where your good enough is or where your customer's good enough is or where your family's good enough is and strive for that instead of perfection. Realize that this is, if you're somebody that has imposter feelings or has had them, it'll take time. It might be a lifelong journey. Um, I know that you know, I've, since 2012, this is something that, that keeps coming up in my, my life over and over again. Um, and it's hard. In fact, when I was doing some research for this talk, I did some Googling as we normally do, and I came up with this amazing talk by Nicholas Means. Now here I'd been accepted to, I think, besides Nova, to give a 25 minute talk on imposter feelings. And I'm listening to Nicholas's Means, Nicholas Means' um, 30 minute Rails Conf talk on imposter feelings. I'm like, holy shit, this is exactly the talk that I was gonna give. People are gonna think I'm a fraud. They're gonna think that I stole from Nicholas. What am I gonna do? I've already committed my, it was, it was tough. It's an excellent talk, it really is. Nicholas brings up one point that I'd like to leave you with. In his talk, he mentions that this is something that, that if you have imposter feelings, you may need to work with them for a long time. And you might not ever see yourself as not an imposter. But what he said is, at least you can be a high-functioning imposter. <laughs> That's what I strive to be. So... If you have any questions or comments, um, this is a link to my website, webbreacher.com. I have a post there about imposter feelings. I have links to some of the other versions of this talk, and I'll link to this talk once it's posted online. Um, if you would rather not shout out a question <laughs> because you're feeling like you want some more private talk time, um, there's my Twitter handle. Um, you can come up here and give me a card, an email address, whatever, and we can carry on the conversation um, offline. And I'm happy to talk to anybody about, uh, about this or just anything. So thank you very much. And uh, come up and talk to me.
Does anybody have any questions they want to shout out? <laughs> yes, sir. How do you learn to accept compliments? How do you learn to accept compliments? Um, very slowly is what I'm finding. Um, y what I like to do is when somebody does give me a compliment, uh, it depends on whether it's praise or really something that's a compliment. And there's a difference. If I said to you, good job on that, that's kind of praise because you don't know what specifically you did or wrote or, or, or said that really uh, made them feel good or, or, or whatever. So what I try to do is I'll ask, well, hey, you know, you, you liked what, that, what I did, what I said, what I wrote. What was it in particular? Give me a detail about, about what it was so that I can keep doing that. I can do that for other people. So I like having the, uh, getting details about what, what actually was, uh, uh, what I was complimented on. Other questions? Okay. Well, you're free to go. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.